when celebrated novelist Emma Donahue set out to write about the last pandemic, most of us didn't know what life would look like in those conditions. But as her book is set to be released tomorrow, we understand the world of contagion all too well. Set against the backdrop of a Dublin maternity ward and an epidemic that claimed the lives of millions, the book is called The Pull of the Stars, and Emma Donahue joins us from her home in London, Ontario. Hi, Emma. It's Hi, so nice, nice to meet you. Um, I'm from London, Ontario, so yay to the Forest City. <laughs> excellent, excellent. <laughs> Uh, so this book is about a pandemic and it's coming out during a pandemic. How did you come to write this novel? It's it's pure fluke. Um, I, I wrote the novel um, triggered by reading books about the 1918 flu in 2018. You know, it was the centenary. It seemed like distant history. But I was so seized by a sense of how strange that pandemic must have been, the, the kind of post-apocalyptic atmosphere of those cities trying to get on with their busy urban economies in the middle of a world war while they were afraid of being within close range of other human beings. So I didn't write it for any contemporary relevance, but of course, you know, books take a long time to write. So by the time it's coming out, we find ourselves in the middle of COVID and that gives a, an eerie new relevance to it, I have to say. So you started writing this book in 2018 um, to mark 100 years since the 1918 flu. I was reading this book and you wrote it, I, you actually handed in the first draft like two days before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic. And, and I'm reading the book and I'm blown away with how accurate some of the things that you write are about today's world. When you read it or when you look at the words that you um, wrote, are you taken aback by some of the thing of how accurate some of the things that you wrote are to today's world? I guess it just shows that, you know, trying to do medical care in a pandemic is always going to feel like this. You know, there would be a bigger gap between, you know, the the um, the, the plague of London in the in the 1600s than between 1918 and now. I mean, in 1918, they didn't know as much, but they were trying. They were trying to be scientific in a moment of total confusion. And like us, all sorts of rumors spread wildly. Uh, and like us, it was very difficult to weigh up the economic costs of, of shutdown with the the um, the need to keep people safe. There were anti-mask leagues, for instance, in 1918. There was all sorts of confusion. You know, they would tell people to kiss through a handkerchief if they had to kiss. Um, and yet they would leave um, communal water drinking cups in trains because they thought, oh, they're safe. They're washed out by water. So um, it actually wasn't a very different world from now. Um, and one thing I really like about having a a novel like this coming out now is that it, it it's all about healthcare workers and i think we're all collectively fascinated by how on earth they continue to do the heroic stuff they do while they're in personal fear as well as exhausted well since you brought up uh the healthcare workers um right now that are essential to our every day in the book you do write about um a nurse um even though she's very well educated, even though she's very capable because she's a nurse, because she's a woman and because she hasn't had, uh, she's not married or hasn't had children, it seems as if society kind of looks down on her. Um, and I think that's maybe a theme that could be echoed today. Um, correct me if I'm wrong. You're so right. You know, uh, a parallel situation would be, you know, the, the, um, the mostly women and um, very often women of color who staff so many long-term healthcare facilities. You know, it turns out this is like the most crucial job around, and yet is it a high status one? And um, is it like being a specialist surgeon? Is it a well-paid job? And uh, you know, does security go with that kind of work? Same with say migrant farm workers. There are a lot of jobs that we used to think of as low status, and we're now saying they're literally the jobs in which the lives of the rest of us depend. So yeah, my 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 nurse Julia Power in 1918, she's, you know, it's the kind of job a woman could get when it was hard for women to get many other jobs. So she's not well paid at all. She's worked brutal, brutal hours. And yet, um, you know, she's absolutely crucial. So I think one reason I write about the job of nurse in several of my books is because it's a fascinating mixture of clearly really important and dramatic and yet, you know, uh, sneered at as kind of, you know, just just another form of domestic service. Um, and your writing, I know you hear this from a lot of people, but allow me to gush for a second. Uh, your writing is so rich. Um, it, it, you. it takes you to back to, I still see the characters in my head. I still see that room where most of the story takes place. How much research goes into writing a book like this? 
A lot. Um, and I always come across certain, you know, limitations in myself. You know, I can I can read a lot about certain procedures and still have difficulty grasping them. So, you know, at, at the last minute in the copy editing stage, um, luckily I had both an emergency room physician who's also a copy editor, copy editing my work. And I also had a midwife very kindly giving me a kind of a a check through as well and they caught some really embarrassing errors to do with blood pressure it turns out i still do not understand the two figures in blood pressure <laughs> so yeah uh, that's a huge amount of work and also what's really crucial is is you can't you can't ever stop the novel to explain things to your readers so i was quite worried that my doctors and nurses would come across as either blundering or downright criminal you know they're doing things like injecting strychnine into patients stuff that sounds just such a bad call and yet by the science of 1918 it was cutting edge they were doing their best so you have to get the information but also present it in the text in such a way that your readers won't totally misunderstand what your characters are up to that one scene of using lysol to clean intimate parts to me i was just like what <laughs> oh yeah there's a lot of history of that isn't there <laughs> And I think on this, um, we've talked about the pandemic a little bit, but from uh, from reading the book, it feels as if there's another story that you're telling. The story takes place in a maternity ward um, in Dublin. So, two part of question: Why did you set it in? Why did you set it in Dublin? Um, and what story are you trying to tell about the business of birth? Yeah, um, I I suppose. What fascinated me at first was the flu. And one one statistic that jumped out at me was that pregnant women near labor or just after labor for a couple of weeks after were really vulnerable to catching it and to having terrible effects. And it, it messed up births. It brought on premature births and stillbirths and so on. So I thought, oh, what an interesting overlap of two different medical dangers. And and they would lead to two different kinds of storyline because, you know, with the flu, there's a certain trajectory to people being really ill and then either recovering or dying. And then birth is a very different kind of storyline with a different pace. It can be like nothing's happening and then high drama or else another birth can last five days. So I thought it would be really interesting to bring those together. And given that the novel is set during World War I, which is so often, you know, I've read so many books about men going to war in the trenches and very moving books they are, but it was really interesting to focus on what women were up to during that time. And I thought uh, a labor ward staffed by and full of women patients um, would would really uh, recenter the whole thing on women's experience during, during war and there's a moment when julia my nurse has an argument with the male orderly who's saying like you women don't deserve a vote because you don't serve you don't pay the blood tax and she's like we pay the blood tax all the time look around you you know this is where the nation starts in this ward so yeah the novel is is really fo quite focused on gender but also on poverty because by choosing Dublin, which I chose because it's my home city and I thought I could sort of get the idiom right, but Dublin had really, really bad slums and and, and really high uh, death rate for babies, partly because of Irish culture's obsession with making babies. I mean, I'm the youngest of eight myself, you know, our, our birth rate has until recent generations been astonishingly high because of Catholicism. So I was really interested in looking at Ireland as a culture where women had to just keep pumping out the babies no matter what and to show it at a very at a very high stakes moment where that culture would sort of come under the microscope because you're looking at these women who are literally shattered and worn out by making babies. Um, since you brought that up, I just wanted to read an excerpt from your book um, about that very thing. You write, Haggard at 33 years old, pale, but for those flame red cheeks, her belly a hard hill. 11 previous deliveries, it said on Ida Noonan's chart, seven children still living, and this 12th birth not expected for another two and a half months. Since Mrs. Noonan had been able to tell us nothing about when she might have conceived or when she had felt the quickening, Sister Finnegan had had to make a stab at the due date based on the height of the uterus. My job wasn't to cure all Ida Noonan's ills, but to bring her safe through this particular calamity, I reminded myself, to push her little boat back into the current of what I imagined to be her barely bearable life. That one sentence, wow. The expression you used uh, in this story was, she doesn't love him unless she gives him 12. What does that mean? Well, that, you know, a, a real wife, a real wife would give him 12 kids, would not hold back from her, her God-given duty to please her husband and please the whole country by providing babies. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm very fond of Ireland, but I have to say there are aspects of his culture that, that definitely need critiquing. And, and because I focused on these, these, you know, working class women who have such, such poverty and malnutrition and sort of live off tea and bread and have so many babies, it really meant that 
the, the question of health kept getting politicized in the book. I tried to keep kind of overt parliamentary politics out of it, even though Ireland was in the middle of a kind of a, are we going to rule ourselves or are we going to stay part of the British Empire? But the politics kept creeping back in because as we're all realizing during COVID, health is political. You know, um, you know, communities that are marginalized or impoverished or communities of color are having much worse death rates specifically because of non-medical factors, because of social factors. So the idea that you could sort of write a drama about medicine and divorce it from its social and political context, it turns out to be nonsense. You know, poverty and, uh, is a comorbid condition. And I suppose that's one of the things that's really coming up in this book. And that conversation was between um, Dr. Lynn and uh, Julia. Um, I want to come back to that in just one second, but I wanted to go back um, to the flu for a quick moment. Did people understand why they were getting the flu? Or um, when we talk about health, did they know what was happening? Why it was well, happening? I mean, they had an idea that they got it from other people, right? So they, they understood contagion in that sense. But um, they didn't think about things like, say, sharing the same water cup. Um, and there were theories that perhaps it, it was from um, all the corpses in the trenches in the war, you know, that literally bad air was blowing across the channel. So, you know, even people who were quite scientifically trained, like Dr. Lynn, who's a real, a real Irish doctor I included in the book. So even though she knows about washing your hands and so on, she also has vague fears about maybe, you know, the, it's the, it's the emanations of corpses. So nobody quite knew which things were more dangerous than other things. So it's like, it's like today with all the squabbling about masks and how many meters apart you can be. And um, they, knew, they knew enough to be freaked out, but not enough to really keep themselves safe. And above all, they didn't know how long they had to be careful. So, so the paradox with the 1918 flu is, you know, there was a, a, bad, a bad peak of it in the spring, and then by August it all seemed over. And so they, they kind of went out in the streets again and um, celebrated the end of the war. And that was when the really terrible surge happened. So um, yeah, there are all sorts of echoes. I have to say it's unnerving to be publishing this right now. Right now, um, as people are talking about the possibility of a second wave coming up in the next few months, maybe that is something that we should be paying a bit more attention to. Um, without giving too much weight of the story, I, I would like to talk about, um, you know, the characters. Can you tell me about Nurse Julia Power? Sure. Um, well, I decided I wanted Julia to be, you know, well educated as a nurse and and quite smart but she can't know more than anyone would know in 1918 so i had to avoid giving her sort of anachronistically good techniques in say midwifery or nursing <laughs> so often she's in a position of having very good instincts um, but not sure what to do for instance there's a, a stillbirth in the novel and you know absolute policy at the time was you, you take up that stillborn baby and you you literally hide it away and you don't mention it again you encourage the mother not to talk about it. Nowadays, this would be considered brutally callous. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, I, at a moment like that, I, I give Julia a moment to sort of, oh, I don't know, should I maybe show the dead baby to the mother? Um, but you can't have her be anachronistic. So, so Julia is very much of 1918 and trying to get on with her job and trying not to be distracted as she sees it by, by political matters like, you know, the Irish revolutionary movement. But of course, she's smart enough that she's thinking about her patients and their, their poverty and their illness. And so it is making her start thinking about the bigger questions of social justice and who should rule her country. Um, and I also gave her an interesting home setting in that she lives with a brother who's just back from the war and he has not spoken since he came home. He's, he's you know, he's got what they used to call war neurosis. He's, he was messed up by the war. So I, I thought it would be interesting to give her like a, a domestic home life, which does nourish her, but she's still not actually married. Um, and then my, my other characters are a doctor, Kathleen Lynn, who was an Irish revolutionary as well as being a, a, a groundbreaking doctor. And then I decided to, to bring in a really low status character who's just a volunteer helper because I was so moved by a quote I came across in a, in a book on the 1918 pandemic called American Pandemic. Um, this, this volunteer was quoted as saying that she had a, a more wonderful experience in the last eight days of her time volunteering in the hospital than in her 25 years then. And she died on the eighth day of helping um, that woman. So, so I really wanted to include this absolute nobody. So I invented a character called Bridie Sweeney, who's just, mm -hmm. just a girl who volunteers. And um, I thought it would be wonderful to draw the reader in in that way, to show somebody coming into this hospital world who knows nothing about what to do, um, and yet has all the right instincts for saving lives. And she brings so much color, um, it, so to speak, in a way to the story. Um, and I noticed maybe this is just um, a, a coincidence, but there seems to be a number three um, going 
on. Uh, we have the three characters, and then it seems to take uh, place in three different places. Um, why did you want to have those three characters um, telling this particular story? I suppose, I mean, you'll have noticed that I tend to go for kind of tight little settings you know i'm best known for my novel room which literally takes place in a locked room and so i keep to, i seem to keep cruelly <laughs> confining my characters it's it's really i just don't feel i have the skills for a big sort of sweeping epic that would roam over the worldwide territories that either world war one took place in or that the flu took place in i can i can only really control my story enough to do it very intensely if i limit the setting but i also love that increased tension that you get if people are stuck somewhere um, so um, I suppose I knew that there would be key characters who were patients and so on, but at the, at, in terms of the healthcare workers, I wanted to show the sort of three sides of it, you know, that nurses were it really, they were the ones who, who saved most lives during the pandemic because all that, you know, nursing and keep, keeping people hydrated and, and reassured and so on, when there was no good medicine, they were mostly using whiskey, whiskey or aspirin. Um, so, so nurses were really important, but didn't have any powers to say prescribe medicine. And then you have doctors, and then I thought I would have a volunteer helper as well. Um, and I suppose that that way we end up with the kind of you know made mother crone division of you know the kind of three mythic mythic women. And um, I really I, I grew up soaked in fairy tales, so those kind of archetypal structures tend to show up um, in the background of a lot of things I write. And, and, we, and at a certain point I thought, oh, these people are all women. And then I thought, that's fine. This particular novel is just gonna be set in a woman's world. And that's, that's how it is with this one. And we also um, have, uh, the church is also present in the story. Um, Lumen. Nuns who Lumen. ran the hospital <laughs> yeah. and the lay people. Um, what kind of power did the church have uh, in 1918 in Dublin? It's funny, it's, it, it's not so much that, you know, it ruled by by contrast with the government. It's more that um, the British government who were ruling Ireland and then, you know, late on 10 years later, the Irish government who were ruling Ireland, they've always found it really convenient to use the, the massive um, staff available of, of um, Catholic um, brothers and, uh, you know, monks and brothers and uh, nuns. So basically Irish institutions such as schools and hospitals have always been absolutely um, staffed by by um, Catholic religious orders. It was, it was a system that worked. And so Ireland built up this network of so many residential schools for those who were seen as, you know, needing to be contained, as it were. So, yeah, orphans, but also kids whose parents, you know, let them beg in the street. There was a lot of what we think of in Canada as a specifically racist policy, um, policy of, you know, scooping up indigenous people. Well, in Ireland, this happened not to any particular ethnic group, but just to the poor, basically. So we had really high rates of institutional confinement of of kids um, all the way through from you know pregnant women were sent to what are called magdalen laundries all the way through to uh, you know orphanages and residential schools and um, um sort of reformatories for troublesome kids um, and i decided to have bridey come from one of these institutions because they really had such a huge effect on irish life they were such a huge hidden population and um they, they've been notorious for the abuses that happened there so on the one hand it's great that the church was provided so many nurses so many teachers but on the other hand the church has so much to account for um you talked about uh bridey sweeney um is she is that what you're talking about when you write in the book about the pipe yeah yeah she 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 talks about the pipe um uh, in that she says if you're born into a, a mother and baby home, you know, and then you're sent off to an orphanage and then you're kept on in a residential school and then you might be, you know, flung out of the world for a few years. And if you end up pregnant, then you're back in the pipe. So obviously I borrowed this phrase from the pipeline, the, the school to prison pipeline um, in, in books I've read about the American, the American welfare system. So just this idea of being kind of stuck on a, on a socially low impoverished track and no way of getting out of it. Um, so I made myself read the entire um, government inquiry report into Irish residential institutions. And I, I only actually borrowed it from some of the milder details. I didn't put in the more horrifying cases because they just sounded like something out of the Marquis de Sade. Um, but it was really important to me to have Bridie Sweeney, who's this very bright and vital and lively and funny character, um, come from this background of, of mistreatment and yet have such a spirit to her, you know? Why was that important to, um, why was it important for her to have that background? 
Well, I think because, you know, the whole novel is set in an institution, a hospital, which is clearly, you know, doing good. Um, and so I thought it was really useful to sort of show the other side of that, which is that every time we give power to these organizations like schools or hospitals or, you know, um, uh, care homes, any of these institutions can go wrong, um, especially if we stash in them people who are low status or we stash in them people who we forget about. And maybe we don't send the inspectors, we just call up to say, everything okay? So, so I think, uh, I suppose a novel like The Pull of the Stars is, is part of a, a whole wave of fiction you're seeing in countries like Ireland or Canada, where we re-examine aspects of our past, and in particular, who we stashed away in, in buildings uh, outside of the public gaze. You know? When in um, Canada, when we had the inquiry into the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, a lot of a lot of the country um, found out how cruel and oppressive it was. When you were writing the book and you were doing all this research, is this when you found out about that part of the history of Ireland, or did you already know this stuff? I think I already knew, but put it this way: as an Irish woman who's moved to Canada, I, I hear those echoes. Um, and, and those differences, frankly, because it's a different thing here. You know, the residential schools were used very specifically uh, as a form of genocide against indigenous people. Whereas in Ireland, that same kind of dynamic can go on, but it's much more at the level of class. It's like, you know, the poor being treated badly by the rich or the poor being swept off the streets so that the middle class don't see them begging. Um, so very similar pattern and horrible, just not the same thing as what happened in Canada where it was more specifically racist. Moving to another country as a writer, it's really interesting because anything that helps you to see your own culture slightly from outside or that lets you see this new culture slightly from the outside, these are all very good um, educational experiences for writers or for anyone. But put it this way, I would have much less to say if I hadn't lived in several countries and been able to see things with that slight uh, stranger's gaze. When we talk about the poverty that was taking place uh, in Dublin, what was behind that poverty? Well, uh, Dublin had been a capital, and then because um, Ireland entered a union with Britain, and um, you know all the all the rich members of Parliament and their families headed off to London, so um, it it got kind of gutted politically, um, and 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 the the beautiful big houses, Georgian architecture that used to have one rich family in them, they became sort of tenement slums, um, with you know uh, several families living in each room. Uh, so I think Dublin or, or a city like Detroit, you could say a similar thing. Um, in Ireland, there was a sort of a middle class flight from the centre of Dublin out to the suburbs and then the city centre got poorer and poorer. So um, again, you see these patterns recurring all over the world, but in, 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 different, in different variations, depending on what the population were. Uh, let's fast forward to now um, and your book being out during COVID-19. What did all the work that you put into uh, this book teach you? about the pandemic that we're dealing with now? It made me just so grateful to healthcare workers who put their lives on the line, it really did. Um, you know, I've had a very easy pandemic, writing's a job you can do at long distance. So I've been, you know, tucked away at home and, and um, say I've a, I have a niece who's a nurse. So it's just, it's such a different life when you have to mask, mask on and, and off you go, not even knowing what the risks are. Um, so, so, it's given me a very nitty gritty appreciation for um, how, how nurses and doctors and healthcare workers have to be, they have to be sort of psychologically excellent with their patients as well as medically excellent because we've seen doctors have, having to learn new tasks like, um, you know, um, um, zooming the families of the dying and holding up the iPad, you know, tasks mm -hmm. they've never had to do before. They've had to stand in for families because of the contagion danger. So there they are, they're risking their lives and they're having to be sort of, um, you know, uh, spontaneous family members to the dying. Um, so I, I can't quite imagine what they've gone through. Um, so that's mostly what this book has left me with. Um, and we hear a lot about disappointment. Um, um, kids who are supposed to graduate we have to find a new way to graduate. Uh, you mentioned how uh, we're dealing uh, when people die. We've had to rethink how we grieve and how we say goodbye to loved ones. But your um, room, uh, the play, uh, was supposed to be running in the UK now, um, and that had to be canceled because of COVID-19. So I guess in a way, um, how have you dealt with that kind of disappointment? Yeah, my, my pandemic began with that one big disappointment. It was actually um, the, the Canadian premiere, the North American premiere was about to open in London, Ontario with Alexis Gordon. I have to say such a star, just 
just an extraordinary cast and they were all ready and had, had some great previews and then it got cancelled at the last minute. Um, but I suppose it meant that nothing else during the pandemic has really rocked me too much because that was such a heartbreaker right at the start. And, you know, everyone I know working in, in theatre um, has had such a, a, a blow. Um, so I'm just I'm just praying we find some way for live performance to come back. You know, I, I can't imagine my world without it. Pull of the Stars, um, the title has a very interesting meaning. Where does the title come from? Well, influenza, the sort of official name for flu, um, it actually means influence. So it's an Italian, it's a, it's a Renaissance or medieval Italian concept that the stars were influencing us. And that, you know, just as they didn't know where the illness came from, they thought it might be the stars somehow, you know, pulling our chains as it were. Um, so I like the idea that that not only illness might be understood as, as the stars influencing us, but also, you know, your fate and the kind of randomness of who you meet, who you fall in love with, what job you walk into, where you end up. You know, here I am in Canada all because I fell in love with a Canadian. You know, there are aspects of what happens to us that can be explained through kind of social or political analysis. And then there's the random factor. So I suppose that's what the pull of the stars means. Uh, it's such a beautiful book. We really appreciate your time. You. And I think it'll give people an opportunity to maybe think about um, some things that they could change. I think it's kind of like a reference book to what's happening uh, in the world right now. Thank you so much for your time, Emma. We appreciate it. Thanks, ma'am. This is lovely. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.